family comes first. Family comes first. Honeymoon. 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 I didn't make 200, but I love you. I love you. So I'm reprising a talk that I gave in September at Carnegie Mellon University. There's an academic tradition called the last lecture. Hypothetically, if you knew you were going to die and you had one last lecture, what would you say to your students? Well, for me, there's an elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is that for me, it wasn't hypothetical. I've been fighting pancreatic cancer. It has now come back after surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. And the doctors tell me there's nothing more to do and I have months to live. I don't like this. I have three little kids. Let's be clear, this stinks. But I can't do anything about the fact that I'm going to die. I'm pursuing medical treatments. But I pretty much know how this movie is going to end. And I can't control the cards I'm dealt, just how I play the hands. So, today's talk is not about death. It's about life and how to live. Specifically about childhood dreams and about how you can try to achieve them. My childhood dreams, your childhood dreams. It was an easy time to dream. When you turn on your television set and men are landing on the moon, anything is possible. And we should never lose that spirit. Now, I played Little League football for a long time. And I had a phenomenal coach, Coach Jim Graham. And he was old school. When I was at a practice, he rode me all practice. You know, you're doing it wrong. Go back. Do it again. You're sloughing off. You owe me push-ups. Just for two hours. It was relentless. And after practice, one of the assistant coaches came up to me and he said, yeah, Coach Graham rode you pretty hard. And I said, yeah. And he said, that's a good thing. Because it means he cares. When you're doing a bad job and nobody points it out to you, that's when they've given up on you. And that's something that's really stuck with me, is when somebody is going to ride you for two hours, they're doing that because they care to make you better. So probably the, the most wonderful thing my parents did was they let me paint my bedroom. I said one day, I want to paint stuff on the walls. And they said, OK. So I had a rocket ship. And we lived in a ranch, so I wanted an elevator. I wasn't sure where it would go. And uh, yeah, you can tell the nerds early, so that's the quadratic equation. But the great thing is that they let me do it. And they felt that letting me express my creativity was more important than the pristine nature of the walls. And I was really blessed to have parents who saw it that way. My parents taught me about the importance of people versus things. So when I got older and I bought my first car and I was so excited, I had this shiny new convertible. This is my niece and nephew, Christopher and Lara. And every, every month, I'd take them for a weekend. So my sister and her husband would get a little break. And we'd go off on adventures. And I'd just shown up with my new car. And my sister's explaining to Chris and Laura, now it's Uncle Randy's new car. You can't get it dirty, da 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 And they're just cracking up laughing. Because over her shoulder, I'm casually opening a can of soda and just emptying it on the back seat. And they come running over. My sister says, what are you doing? And I said, it's a thing. It's just a thing. And I'm really glad I did that. Because at the end of the weekend, as I was driving them home, Little Chris, who was about eight at the time, had had the flu, and he threw up all over the back seat of my car. <laughs> and I don't care how much value you get out of owning a nice, shiny, pristine thing. It's not as good as I felt knowing that I made an eight-year-old boy not feel guilty just because he'd had the flu. Next thing, you better decide early on if you're a Tigger or an Eeyore. <laughs> Tiggers are energetic, they're optimistic, they're curious, they're enthusiastic, and they have fun, and never ever underestimate the importance of having fun. I am dying soon, and I am choosing to have fun today, tomorrow, and every other day I have left. If you want to achieve your dreams, you better work and play well with others. And that means you better live with integrity. Simple advice that you'll find hard to follow, just tell the truth. Second thing, when you screw up, apologize. There are a lot of bad apologies in America. A good apology has three parts. I'm sorry. It was my fault. How do I make it right? Most people skip that third part. That's how you can tell sincerity. The last thing is that we all have people that we don't like, that have done things we don't like. And what I have found is no one is pure evil. If you wait long enough, they will show you their good side. You can't make them do it in a hurry, but you can be patient. Show gratitude. When I got tenure as a young faculty member, 
There were about 15 young kids who'd been working in my research lab. I took them all down to Disney World for a week on my nickel. And one of my colleagues said, this must have cost you an arm and a leg. How could you do it? And I said, these kids just worked day and night for years so that I could get the best job in the world for life. How could I not do it? I mean, gratitude is a very simple thing, and it's a very powerful thing. And lastly, I don't think complaining and whining really solves the problem. This is Jackie Robinson, first black major leaguer, had it in his contract not to complain if people spit on him. All right? Now, I don't care if you're Jackie Robinson or if you're a guy like me who's only got a couple of months to live. You can choose to take your finite time and energy and effort, and you can spend it complaining, or you can spend it playing the game hard, which is probably going to be more helpful to you in the long run. Now, I told you this is part of the lecture series at Carnegie Mellon University, and it's important for you to know why I gave the talk. Okay? The talk isn't just about how to achieve your childhood dreams. It's much broader than that. It's about how to live your life. Because if you lead your life the right way, the karma will take care of itself. The dreams will come to you. If you live properly, the dreams will come to you. I think it's great that so many people have benefited from this lecture, but the truth of the matter is that I didn't even really give it to the 400 people at Carnegie Mellon who came. I only wrote this lecture for three people. And when they're older, they'll watch it. Thank you. So I started thinking about my life, and I started thinking about this conference and what we're about. And, and I looked back, and I thought, well, I was two people my whole life. I was in the living room entertaining people, being a monkey, you know, doing my thing for the company and, and trying to relieve my mother, who was suffering. She had uh, rheumatoid arthritis and phlebitis and everything, everything under the sun that was nagging at her, and she was depressed and I wanted her to be free and I wanted her to realize that her life was worth something because she gave birth to someone who was worth something and then I would go into my room and I would sit with a legal pad <laughs> I was a little kid I would sit there I would try to figure out what it meant, what it was all about. Why are we here? What is this? And one day, I read something from Buddha that said that all spirituality is about relieving suffering. And I suddenly realized, that's what I'm doing in the other room. <laughs> and, and I'm aligned. This, my purpose is aligned with this. So I felt incredibly lucky. I lose sight of that all the time. I get caught up in different concerns and ego concerns. But I'm so lucky to be a part of this community and to, to, to do something that is of value. why America is the greatest country in the world? Diversity and opportunity. Lewis? Uh, freedom and freedom. So let's keep it that way. Well, why is America Not the greatest, the greatest country in the world, Professor. That's my answer. You're saying... Yes. Let's talk about... Fine. The Sharon, the NEA is a loser. Yeah, it accounts for a penny out of her paycheck, but he gets to hit you with it anytime he wants. It doesn't cost money. It costs votes. It costs airtime and column inches. You know why people don't like liberals? Because they lose. If liberals are so fucking smart, how come they lose so goddamn always? Hey. And with a straight face, you're going to tell students that America is so star-spangled awesome that we're the only ones in the world who have freedom? Canada has freedom. Japan has freedom. The UK, France, Italy, Germany, Spain, Australia, Belgium has freedom. So 207 sovereign states in the world, like 180 of them have freedom. All right. And yeah, you, uh, sorority girl, just in case you accidentally wander into a voting booth one day, there's some things you should know. And one of them is 
There is absolutely no evidence to support the statement that we're the greatest country in the world. We're seventh in literacy, 27th in math, 22nd in science, 49th in life expectancy, 178th in infant mortality, third in median household income, number four in labor force, and number four in exports. We lead the world in only three categories. Number of incarcerated citizens per capita, number of adults who believe angels are real, and defense spending, where we spend more than the next 26 countries combined, 25 of whom are allies. Now, none of this is the fault of a 20-year-old college student, but you nonetheless are, without a doubt, a member of the worst period, generation period ever, period. So when you ask what makes us the greatest country in the world, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Yosemite? Sure used to be. We stood up for what was right. We fought for moral reasons. We passed laws, struck down laws for moral reasons. We waged wars on poverty, not poor people. We sacrificed, we cared about our neighbors, we put our money where our mouths were, and we never beat our chest. We built great big things, made ungodly technological advances, explored the universe, cured diseases, and we cultivated the world's greatest artists and the world's greatest economy. We reached for the stars, acted like men. We aspired to intelligence. We didn't belittle it. It didn't make us feel inferior. We didn't identify ourselves by who we voted for in the last election, and we didn't, we didn't scare so easy. We were able to be all these things and do all these things because we were informed by great men, men who were revered. First step in solving any problem is recognizing there is one. America is not the greatest country in the world anymore. Enough? Right now, there is a kid finishing parents' evening in a heated discussion with his mother, saying, why does he have to study subjects he will never ever use in his life? And she will look at him blank-eyed, stifle a sigh, think for a second, and then lie. She'll say something along the lines of, you know to get a good job you need a good degree, and these subjects will help you get a good degree. We never had this opportunity when I was younger. And he will reply, but you were young a long time ago won't you mum? And she won't respond, although what he implies makes perfect sense that society's needs would have changed since she was 16, but she will ignore him, grip his hand more sternly, then drag him to the car. But what she doesn't know is that she didn't ignore him just to shut him up. She didn't lie because they were just returning from parents evening and an argument in the hallway would look bad on her resume. She won't lie because she just spent the last one hour convincing a stern faced teacher that she will ensure that her child studies more at home. No, she will lie simply because she does not know any better herself. Although her whole adult life she has never used or applied Pythagoras' theorem, pathetic fallacy and still does not know the value of X, she will rely on society to tell her that her child, who has one of the sharpest minds in the school, is hyperactive, unfocused, easily distracted and wayward. Students, how many equations, subjects and dates did you memorise just before an exam never to use again? How many A grades did you get which were never asked for when you applied for a job? How many times have you remembered something five minutes just after the teacher said stop writing, only to receive your results one month later to realise that you were only one mark short of the top grade? Does that mean remembering five minutes earlier would have made you more qualified for a particular job? Well, on application form it would have. We all have different abilities, thought processes, experiences and genes. So why is a class full of individuals tested by the same means? So does that mean Sherelle thinks she's dumb because she couldn't do a couple of sums? And if this issue is not addressed properly, it then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then every school has the audacity to have a policy on equality. <laughs> the irony. Exams are society's methods of telling you what you're worth. 
but you can't let society tell you what you are because it's the same society that tells you that abortion is wrong but then looks down on teenage parents the same society that sells products to promote natural hair looks and smooth complexion with the model on the box half photoshopped and has fake lashes and hair extensions with pastors that preach charity but own private jets imams that preach against greed but all fat parents that say they want educated kids but constantly marvel at how rich Richard Branson is governments that preach peace but endorse wars that say they believe so much in the importance of higher education and further learning then why increase tuition fees every single year I believe Miss Jefferson when she took me into the office and said that my exams would be imperative to my success because we was taught to always follow when Miss Jefferson led but then I took Jefferson out of the equation and learned to think for myself I realized we was taught to always follow when Miss led huh the irony Test us with tests, but the finals are never final Because they never prepare us for the biggest test, which is survival And what I suggest is fairly outlandish So I do not expect everyone to understand this Except for the kids who knows what it feels like To be worth no more than that D or that A that you get on results day And the ones whose best stories were never good enough for the English teacher Because apparently you missed out key literal techniques Did not follow the class plan And the language was too informal for him to understand But then he'd reference Hamlet and Macbeth And you'd fight the urge to express your contempt by partially clenching your fist with only your medius finger left protruding in the middle of your hand and then ask if he was aware that Shakespeare was known as the innovator of slang or the kid at the back of the class who thinks why am I studying something that doesn't fuel my drive but then when confronted with a maths problem his eyes come alive so this one is for my generation the ones who found what they were looking for on Google the ones who followed their dreams on Twitter pictured their future on Instagram accepted destiny on Facebook this one's for my failures and my dropouts for my unemployed graduates, my shop assistants, cleaners and cashiers with bigger dreams My self-employed entrepreneurs, my world changers and my dream chasers Because the purpose of why I hate school but love education Was not to initiate a worldwide debate But to let them know that whether 72 or 88, 44 or 68 We will not let exam results decide our fate Peace The modern school was invented by the Prussians after 1806. And it was invented for a very particular purpose, which was to produce loyal, obedient subjects and soldiers, and people who would also be productive and obedient workers. It explains why it is that the school day is divided up into rigid, time-structured blocks. It explains why it is that the organisation of the school is hierarchical and highly structured. Education is something which should be central to most people's lives. What we need to do is to get away from the idea that schools are the only way in which we can deliver education. With each passing day, we move further and further into this post-industrial world. Yet our educational institutions, by and large, are still designed to train students for an industrial world. That's the problem. But as young people, our reaction to this dissonance can't just be to hate school. Now, that doesn't get us anywhere. We need to shift our perception of what schooling is. You know, it's not this end-all, be-all for our future anymore. Now it's just another tool at our disposal. I was actually recently interviewed about the future of education by the Daily Nebraskan, which is the student newspaper for the University of Nebraska, which is the university that I dropped out of a couple years ago. There is a link to the full article below, uh, but I want to read you an excerpt here. There's absolutely an education bubble in the process of bursting, Brown said. The traditional economic model of corporations hire recent college graduates for life is eroding, being replaced by a freelancing and odd job and I work from home and or a coffee shop revolution. As more and more talented people realize that they can jump into the adult world without a degree, having a degree will become a less and less reliable indicator of talent. Brown added that universities are still valuable sites for interacting with people who possess similar passions, but that the cost of attending a university is no longer justified by what one often gains from the experience. As long as universities continue to be the best place for that sort of interaction, they can absolutely charge a premium for it, Brown said. What's in trouble are big lecture halls that just shower students with facts, intro to library type classes, $300 textbooks, and institutions that assume a I can jump through hoops certificate is worth upwards of $50,000. Today's university students need to get better at identifying which parts of their schooling experience are genuinely helpful and then which parts are complete bullshit and then refuse to play into the bullshit. What do you desire? What makes you itch? What sort of a situation would you like? 
Let's suppose, I do this often in vocational guidance of students. They come to me and say, well, uh, we're getting out of college and we haven't the faintest idea what we want to do. So I always ask the question, what would you like to do if money were no object? What, how would you really enjoy spending your life? Well, it's so amazing as a result of our kind of educational system, crowds of students say, well, we'd like to be painters, we'd like to be poets, we'd like to be writers, but as everybody knows, you can't earn any money that way. Or another person says, well, I'd like to live an out-of-doors life and ride horses. I say, do you want to teach in a riding school? Uh, let's go through with it. What do you want to do? When we finally got down to something which the individual says he really wants to do, I will say to him, you do that and uh, forget the money. Uh, because if you say that getting the money is the most important thing, you will spend your life completely wasting your time. You'll be doing things you don't like doing in order to go on living, that is to go on doing things you don't like doing, which is stupid. Better to have a short life that is full of what you like doing than a long life spent in a miserable way. And after all, if you do really like what you're doing, it doesn't matter what it is, you can eventually turn it, uh, you could eventually become a master of it. It's the only way to become a master of something, to be really with it. And then you'll be able to get a good fee for whatever it is. So uh, don't, don't worry too much, uh, that's, uh, everybody's, uh, somebody's interested in everything. And anything you can be interested in, you'll find others in. But it's absolutely stupid to spend your time doing things you don't like in order to go on spending things you don't like and doing things you don't like and to teach your children to follow in the same track. See, what we're doing is we're bringing up children and educating them to live the same sort of lives we're living in order that uh, they may justify themselves and find satisfaction in life by bringing up their children, to bring up their children to do the same thing, so it's all wretch and no vomit. It never gets there. And so, therefore, it's so important to consider this question, what do I desire? Uh, he is not really interested whether that whether there was an immaculate conception or yeah, not, yeah. Or whether the star was there, or whether the wise men went there. But it is the idea of figure of, of Jesus on cross, yeah. Yeah? and it's that passion of Christ which moves him deeply. Now that's really quite profound because it's almost if Gandhi is saying, look, move the dogma aside, move aside all the doctrines, yes. and get to the essence of the teaching. He says, I regard him as perhaps the greatest teacher that mankind has seen. For Gandhi, the real Jesus was not the one developed in the church over the last 2,000 years, the Son of God, born of a virgin, who was the only path to salvation. Gandhi's Jesus was the original charismatic teacher, the man of action, who wanted to change the world. And Gandhi found the core of Jesus' teachings in the Sermon on the Mount. What is the lesson from the sermon that he, he requires? One, that, that you cannot hate. It's not, it's not an active notion of love. It's not an active notion of compassion. It is a negative notion first, that no matter what it is, no matter how hard my opponent is, now, no matter how tyrannical my opponent is, do I have the capacity not to hate? Two, of course, the idea of non-resistance. At the same time, it is not an inactive non-resistance, it is an active act of non-resistance to the evil. Gandhi took Jesus' teachings and transformed them into one of the most powerful political weapons of the 20th century, his philosophy of non-violent resistance. In his long struggle for Indian independence from the British Empire, Gandhi's most famous act of resistance 
took place when he set out on a march in 1930. The right to manufacture salt was a British monopoly. As a symbolic act of defiance, Gandhi planned to break the law by making salt on the coast. But first, he had to march there. This is really the first uh, place where Gandhi halted. Yeah. Uh, they'd walked 13 kilometers that day. Yeah. Uh, by the time they reached here, it was afternoon. And it was a huge reception that the village gave. Uh, I think Gandhi's salt march can be compared to Jesus' final entry into Jerusalem, the culmination of his ministry and his life. Both involved a major confrontation. For Jesus, it was the Romans and the Jewish religious authorities. For Gandhi, it was the British Empire. And for both, it was a highly dangerous strategy. I mean, what do you think was going through the people's minds? Were they apprehensive? Were they optimistic? Did they feel they were going to make it? Gandhi had expected that he would be arrested the night before. Uh, and so the expectation was that British would put him in custody. What happened was completely took him by surprise because when he began walking on 12th March, the entire city walked with him. And, and they had to stop in the city and plead with the people in Ahmedabad to please go back. Yeah. 30,000 people. 30,000 30, people walked oh, with him. It's amazing. Yeah. People probably saw this as the beginning of a revolution. It was the same with Jesus. As he entered Jerusalem, he was also mobbed by a huge crowd. Today, in many of the small villages that Gandhi marched through, local people have built statues to commemorate their hero. Yeah, I just wonder if you could ask the people what Gandhi means to them now. What does he mean to their lives, seeing this bust here? What, what does Gandhi mean to them? Huh? Huh. Father of the nation. Father of the nation. Huh. What does Gandhi mean to you? Gave us independence. With his salt march, Gandhi had started a revolution that later brought an end to British rule in India. Just as Jesus caused uproar in Roman Palestine 2,000 years ago. Okay, so where are we now? This is a place called Navagam, and there is a, a, a statue of Gandhi which tells us that he spent the second night yep. uh, uh, in Navagam, and the only place which could have housed him was the village school. Yep. There's a cross, there's the sign of the Om, and there's the crescent moon, mm. which says, my life is my message. And this is really quite profound because it's like, it, it tells us a, a great deal about Gandhi, bringing together Christianity yeah. with Hinduism, with Islam, and saying that what really matters is how you embody it, how you actually practice these ideas. As we were talking, an elderly man walked up. It turned out that he was here when Gandhi arrived on his march in 1930. Given that I'm making a program about Jesus, mm. does he feel that mm. Mahatma Gandhi was, was like Jesus? Because I see some comparisons in terms of their teachings. Mm. Does he feel that Gandhi was for him like a, like a messiah, a saviour figure? Mm. Mm. He says he was a, he was godlike. He says you know uh, the, the the prophet or Krishna or Ram are only stories for me. Yeah, but here is this man who I have seen, I who I have lived with, and I have seen him transform all of us. What was the most important thing mm. he learned from Gandhi? What mm. meant the most to him, seventy years on? Mm. This is one word, self-reliant, do your own work yourself. He says, I still wash my clothes, do everything that, you know, all the bodily work that I need to do, I do it myself and I don't rely upon people. And he said, I, I hope to be able to do that, you know, till, till, till the very last. That's a really powerful message mm. because when many people think of the teachings of Jesus, and I'm searching for the real Jesus, they think about the spiritual things. Jesus as the Son of God, or the dogma, the Trinity, or ideas about spirituality, which are very kind of otherworldly. But here, what we find in the teachings, and what he said about the way he remembers most about Gandhi, and where it connects with the message of Jesus, is in the practical. Yes. The fact that to have faith, yeah, yeah. To, be, to, to be a person of faith, yeah. is, to, is to live 
Yeah, live, live that faith, live that idealism. And that's why he could say, my life is my message. Mm. Yeah? And Thank, you. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. uh, you. I paid the valley. The Salt March was an absolutely pivotal moment in Gandhi's and India's struggle against the British. And some commentators have argued that it was the beginning of the end of the British Empire. Since then, Gandhi's brilliant use of non-violence has been emulated by hundreds of resistance movements around the world. It was used by Martin Luther King in his struggle for civil rights in America, by Nelson Mandela in his fight against apartheid in South Africa, and by Lech Walesa's solidarity movement in Poland. All of these movements of oppressed and marginalized people for justice and human rights can trace their origins back to Gandhi and his inspiration, his teacher, the author of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus himself. It was a young man who, you know, he wanted to make a lot of money, and so he went to this guru, right? And he told the guru, you know, I want to be on the same level you are. And so the guru said, if you want to be on the same level I'm on, I'll meet you tomorrow at the beach. So the young man got there at 4 a.m. He all ready to rock and roll, got on the suit. He should have worn shorts. The old man grabs his hand and said, how bad do you want to be successful? He said, real bad. He said, walk on out in the water. So he walks out into the water. Watch this. When he walks out into the water, it goes waist deep. So he's like, this guy crazy. Adrian, he's like, I want to make money. He got me out here swimming. I didn't ask to be a lifeguard. I want to make money. He got me in. So he said, come out a little further. Walked out a little further. Then he had it right around this area, the shoulder area. So this old man, crazy. He's making money, but he's crazy. He said, come on out a little further. He came out a little further. It was right at his mouth. My man, like, I'm about to go back in here. This child is mine. But the old man said, I thought you said you wanted to be successful. He said, I do. He said, walk a little further. He came, dropped his head in, held him down, hold him down. My man didn't scratch it, holding him down. He had him held down just before my man was about to pass out. He raised him up. He said, I got a question for you. He told the guy, he said, when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, then you'll be successful. I don't know how many of y'all got asthma here today, but if you ever had an asthma attack before, you short of breath, SOB, shortness of breath, you wheezing. The only thing you trying to do is get some air. You don't care about no basketball game. You don't care what's on TV. You don't care about nobody calling you. You don't care about a party. The only thing you care about when you're trying to breathe is to get some fresh air. That's it. And when you get to the point where all you want to do is be successful, as bad as you want to breathe, then you'll be successful. And I'm here to tell you, number one, that most of you say you want to be successful, but you don't want it bad. You just kind of want it. You don't want it badder than you want to party. You don't want it as much as you want to be cool. You, most of you don't want success as much as you want to sleep. Some of you lost sleep more than you lost success. And I'm here to tell you today, if you're going to be successful, you've got to be willing to give up sleep.
you got to be willing to work off for three hours of sleep, two hours. If you really want to be successful, some days you will have to stay up three days in a row. Because if you go to sleep, you might miss the opportunity to be successful. That's how bad you got to want it. You got to go days without, listen to me, you got to want to be successful so bad that you forget to eat. I said, I got an opportunity to make a dream become a reality. Don't cry to quit. You already in pain, you already hurt, get a reward from it. Don't go to sleep until you succeed. Listen to me, I'm here to tell you today that you can come here, you can jump up, you can do flip, you can be excited when we give away money, but listen to me, you will never be successful until I don't have to give you a dime to do what you do. You won't be successful until you say, I don't need that money, because I got it in here. Then the time come for you to be your own man and take on the world, and you did. But somewhere along the line, you changed. You stopped being you. You let people stick a finger in your face and tell you you're no good. And when things got hard, you started looking for something to blame, like a big shadow. Let me tell you something you already know. The world ain't all sunshine and rainbows. It's a very mean and nasty place, and I don't care how tough you are, it will beat you to your knees and keep you there permanently if you let it. You, me, or nobody is going to hit as hard as life. But it ain't about how hard you hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward, how much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. Now, if you know what you're worth, now go out and get what you're worth. But you got to be willing to take the hits and not pointing fingers saying you ain't where you want to be because of him or her or anybody. Cowards do that and that ain't you. You're better than that. I have a great time with my life and I want to share it. I love living. I think that's infectious. It's something that you can't fake. Greatness is not this um, wonderful, esoteric, elusive, uh, godlike feature that only the special among us are, will ever taste. You know, it's something that truly exists in all of us. It's very simple. This is what I believe, and I'm willing to die for it. Yeah. Period. It's that simple. I know who I am, and I know what I believe. I know who I am, I know who, what and I believe. that's all I need to know. And that's, that's all, all I, I need, need to, to know. know. So from there, you do what you need to do. Yeah. You know? And I think what happens is we make this situation more complex than it has it's to because be. Because we're looking for complexity. There's got to be Absolutely. something complex to understand. It greatness. can't be that easy. No. We didn't grow up uh, with the sense that where we were was where we were going to be. You know, we grew up with the sense that where we were almost didn't matter because... We were it, becoming... It, we were becoming right. something greater. The separation of talent and skill is one of the, 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 the greatest misunderstood concepts for people who are trying to excel, who have dreams, that want to do things. Talent you have naturally. Skill is only developed by hours and hours and hours of beating on your craft. I've, I've never really viewed myself as particularly talented. Where I excel is ridiculous sickening work ethic you know while the other guy's sleeping I'm working while the other guy's eating I'm working there's no easy way around it no matter how talented you are your talent is going to fail you if you're not skilled mm -hmm. you know if you don't study if you don't work uh, really hard and dedicate yourself to being better every single day mm -hmm. you'll never be able to communicate with with people with your artistry the, the way that you want so mm -hmm. the only thing that I see that is distinctly different about me is 
I'm not afraid to die on a treadmill. You might have more talent than me. You might be smarter than me. But if we get on the treadmill together, <laughs> right, there's two things. You're getting off first, yeah. or I'm going to die. It's really that simple. One summer, his dad tore down a brick wall on the front of his business and told 12-year-old Will and his 9-year-old brother to rebuild it, a job they said was impossible. It took them a year and a half, but they did it. And he said, now don't you ever tell me it's something that you can't do. You don't try to build a wall. You don't set out to build a wall. You don't say, I'm going to build the biggest, baddest, greatest wall that's ever been built. You don't start there. You say... I'm going to lay this brick yeah. as perfectly as a brick can be laid. Yeah. And you do that every single day. And soon you have a and wall. And soon you have a wall. You know, it's uh, an idea that my grandmother uh, always had that, it, you know, if you're going to be here, then there's a necessity to make a difference. She always instilled the responsibility, the spiritual responsibility that you have to make every group you come in contact with better. I want to do good. Yeah. I want the world to be better because I was here. I want my life, I want my, my work, uh, my, my family, I want it to mean something. And it's like, it has, if, if you are not making someone else's life better, then you're wasting your time. You know, like the, the, your life will become better by making other lives better. I want to represent an idea. I want to represent possibilities. I want to represent the idea that you really can make what you want. One of my favorite books is The, the Alchemist, mm -hmm. uh, Paolo Coelho. And that's just, I just believe that. I, I believe that I can create whatever I want to create. The first step before anybody else in the world believes it is you have to believe it. There's no reason to have a plan B because it distracts from plan A. <laughs> I think that there's a certain delusional quality that all successful people have to have. You have to believe that something different than what has happened for the last 50 yeah. million yeah. years yeah. of history, you have to believe that something different can happen. Yeah. Confucius said, uh, he who says he can and he who says he can't are both usually right. Being realistic is the most commonly traveled road to mediocrity. Why would you be realistic? What's the point of being realistic? Just put up a barrier. Yeah, I'm going to do it. It's done. It's already done. The second I decide it's done, it's already done. It's right. Now we just got to wait for y'all to see. It's unrealistic to walk in a room and flip a switch and lights come on. That's unrealistic. Fortunately, Edison didn't think so. It's unrealistic to think you're going to bend a piece of metal and fly people over an ocean in that metal. That's unrealistic. But fortunately, the Wright brothers and others didn't, didn't believe that. And it just seems, it, it just seems like such a ridiculous idea to me to embrace the idea that it's not going to happen. And that's not real for that to happen. As soon as you say it, now you just made that real. Feelings, our dreams, our ideas are physical in the universe. That if we dream something, if we picture something, if we commit ourselves to it, that that is a physical thrust towards realization that we can put into the universe. That the universe is not a thing that's going to push us around. That the world and, and people and situations are not something that's going to push us around. That we are going to bend the universe and command and demand that the universe become what we want it to be. I, I study the patterns of the universe. There's a, a redemptive power that making a choice has, you know, rather than feeling like you're at a f effect to all the things that are happening. 
make a choice, right? You just decide what it's going to be, who you're going to be, how you're going to do it. Just decide. And then from that point, the universe is going to get out your way. It's, like, it's water. It wants to, it wants to move and go oh, around yeah. stuff, you know. You know, there's a, there's a flow of the universe that I've, I've grown to know just how to go with it. I realize that when, to, to have the level of success that I, I want to have, it's difficult to spread it out and do multiple things. It takes such a desperate, obsessive focus. You really got to focus with all of your fiber and all of your heart and all of your creativity. I'm motivated by fear. Fear. You know? Um, fear of what? At fear of fear. I hate being scared to do something. And I think what developed uh, in, my, in my early days was the, the attitude that I started attacking things that I was scared of. It was Franklin Roosevelt said the only fear you have to fear is fear itself. Absolutely. Remember that? Absolutely. Yeah. You can't be scared to die for the truth. The truth is the only thing that's ever going to be constant. Don't ever let somebody tell you you can't do something. Not even me. All right? All right. You got a dream, you got to protect it. People can't do something themselves. They want to tell you you can't do it. If you want something, go get it. Period. You have to let it all go, Leo. Fear. Doubt.